As the youngest of seven kids, I often felt like it was my birthright to complain. <laughs> and I remember one time I was, I was on one of my adolescent rants and, and my mother stops me in the middle of my rant and she points at the kitchen table and she fills a glass halfway with water and comes and sets the glass between us and she points at the glass and she says, half full or half empty. And my mom's was good for those kind of trick questions where there is no right answer, so whatever answer you give is the wrong answer, and that's the lesson you need right now. <laughs> so I just kind of stared back blankly, and I, I, didn't, I didn't take the bait. And she says, son, how you choose to answer that question is how you will live your life, because your life will always be both half full and half empty. And if you choose to see your life as half empty, if you choose to see your life for all the things that you don't have, you will never fill your cup. But if you can see your life is half full, if you can see your life for the things that you do have, you will fill your cup, it will overflow, and you can share that with others. That's kind of how I think about Tupac Shakur's poem, The Rose That Grew From Concrete, where he describes young people growing up in poverty as, as the roses that grow from concrete. And you see, the problem in schools is, is that we largely ignore the concrete, even though hey, those conditions that affect young people before they ever step foot in our classrooms are perhaps the single most important conditions that we have to respond to before we can even start talking about common core homework or any of these other things that we're measuring and valuing in schools. Now, of all the stuff that I've read, all the experts that I've met with, hey, nothing has more profoundly impacted my work as a classroom teacher in the last 21 years in my community than this film series from PBS called Unnatural Causes. Okay. And what Pac points out in his poem is how absurd it is if you're walking down the street with the homie okay, and you see a rose growing in the concrete and you turn to the homie like, a rose in the concrete. Okay. And the homie looks back and he's like, yeah, too bad it's got damaged petals. Of course it's got damaged petals, fool, it's growing in the concrete. Okay? <laughs> but we do this all the time with young people. Okay? We focus on their damaged petals, we see them as glasses half empty. Okay? Instead of focusing on their tenacity and their will to reach the sun, seeing them as glasses half full. Now if we're going to do that, okay, we got to understand the concrete a lot better. Now, as the intro said, I'm from East Oakland, I live in a 3400 block. And in 2006, San Francisco Chronicle called itself so concerned with homicide in my community that they started mapping it. And they said that we had the plague, which I find interesting because, as I said, I live on a 3400 block. I live dead in the center of the plague. And the funny thing about the plague is it's the ultimate non-discriminator, isn't it? Doesn't recognize race, doesn't recognize class, doesn't recognize gender, okay? and it sure doesn't recognize political boundaries. But those red lines just popped up, those are the city boundaries of Oakland. And as you can see, hey, this plague has been almost perfectly quarantined. Now you don't have to be a topographical genius looking at this map to see the outlier. Piedmont. What the hell is going on in Piedmont where they could completely opt out of the plague? <laughs> Cornell West jokes that Disneyland brags nobody's ever died on their premises. He says somebody probably has, they just pushed them across the line to keep their record clean. Okay. That's what I think happened right there. <laughs> hey, that was probably in Piedmont. They just gave that back to us. Okay. But you see, our plague has been almost perfectly quarantined okay. between the two freeways, the 580 and the 880, what we call the flatlands or the lower bottoms. In 2007, the San Francisco Chronicle gave up Hey, and since then, the Oakland Tribune has been publishing the homicide map on the front page of the Trib every year. These are the four most recent maps. And so I decided that I would update the map. And I'm going to do that for 13 years, because that's how long young people are in public schools in our community. This is nine years, y'all. This kid just came to my high school class. And you tell me, where can a young person live in our community where they have not witnessed homicide, if not multiple homicides? And what we know is exposure to this kind of trauma leads to PTSD. And the problem with the conversation about PTSD is it's mostly about this dude, which is right because soldiers are particularly prone to PTSD. But ain't nobody talking about these brothers. These are my students. 
burying another one of our students, a 16-year-old, stabbed more than a dozen times in the face with a screwdriver a few blocks from my house. And this is who buried him. And the next day, they're back at school, and what's the conversation in school about? Common core, test scores, homework, college and career readiness. A morally suspect position to take up given what we know is actually happening in the lives of our babies before they even come to us. So at the end of the day, what young people come to realize, the lives of some people matter less than the lives of others in this country. Ferguson. And we could go on and on and on. Fortunately, there is an increasing attention to the lives of young people who are growing up in trauma. Especially by people like this dude. This is a book by a guy named Bruce Perry who is considered the nation's leading expert on child trauma. And what they are revealing very clearly is that if we don't address what's going on in kids' lives, then this whole idea about creating college-ready, common core is just a game that we're playing. It will not fundamentally change what is happening in the lives of the kids that need us the most. The research is clear. One in three urban youth, one in three, display the symptoms of mild to severe PTSD. When they control, c- compare this to the Pentagon's data from soldiers returning from live combat, what they found is that urban youth are actually twice as likely as soldiers returning from the battlefield to have PTSD. Okay? And yet there's no conversation about this in schools that are serving the nation's most vulnerable youth. Look, here's what we know, okay? If we do nothing, okay, if it is just business as usual, okay, some young people will still find their ways up through the cracks and become the roses that they're always meant to be. If we innovate even a little bit in classrooms, get a little more light, a little more soil, a little more water down in the cracks, okay, we know that individual classrooms can grow many more roses than is common even in the most... Uh, uh, suffering and failing schools. And this is what we try to do in the town with a program that we started called the East Oakland Step to College Program. And we have consistently produced uncommon results. This picture is from two cohorts ago. This is our young people just after they graduate sitting on the porch of my house in the little bubbles there are all the four-year colleges they went off to. And while we were doing that, that's what the rest of the district was doing. Four years later, we remix and repeat. Same results. So (laughs) universities from all over the world have come to our program to study what is it that we are doing to produce these uncommon results. And to a study, they've all concluded the same thing, that we don't have pixie dust, we don't have a magic wand, and we certainly do not conduct rocket science. What we do is we go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and we start at the base, make sure that all our kids are well fed, all our kids are clothed, all our kids feel safe, all our kids have access to shelter. And when we got those things stable, then we move them up to make sure that they have a sense of love and belonging, a sense of self. They understand the ancestors. They understand how beautiful they are. They understand who they come from. And when we do those things, as Maslow said 60 years ago, kids start self-actualizing. And self-actualization is the precondition to long-term academic success. The pathway is clear. The problem is not a teacher in this country has ever been evaluated on their ability to do those things, even though even though the science and the research are clear that if you don't do those things, you will not get the things that we're actually evaluating and measuring teachers on. But here's what we know. 20 years in, it's not enough. So now we're trying to push the conversation to say, what would happen 
If we took these things we've been doing in our program and we created an entire institution, okay, what we are calling a community responsive lab school, okay, to look at what would happen if this happens across every classroom in every school and then how do we study that and share that with the other teachers in our city and cities like ours so it's not just kids getting access to a pocket program, but what you, what you experience in youth speaks and programs like that are the norm for all our kids. Now, you might have heard of programs like this before, things like the Harlem Children's Zone, but that, that's not really how we're thinking about it, because the problem with the Harlem Children's Zone is, is that the programs like that, they create all kinds of roses, okay? but they're creating a model of out-migration. Okay? They're creating the opportunity for the deserving few to leave our community. So they come through these amazing programs, and then they leave the community never to come back, and what's left behind in the community is the concrete, and we've got to start all over again. So that's not our vision at all. Our vision is more like Maya's vision. In 1991, Maya sat on a movie set, a movie called Poetic Justice. Young people in here won't know nothing about that, but for folks like us, that's the, that's the jam right there, huh? Okay, okay. Good to know young people are keeping up with the good stuff. She's on, she's on the movie set of Poetic Justice. She walks out of her trailer, okay, and she sees two young brothers about to fight. They're at each other's throats. Okay? And she comes down. Maya's a grandmother, y'all, okay, on a movie set. Okay? Call, call security, Maya. Okay? <laughs> but she doesn't, right? She runs down, and she gets in between these two brothers, and they're going back and forth. Okay? And she starts talking to this brother, and she explains this. She says, do you understand how important you are. Do you understand that our people lay spoon fashion in the filthy hatches of slave ships, in each other's and, 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 and own excrement and minstrel flow so that you could live? Do you understand how important you are to me, to this community, and to this planet? And this brother starts to cry. And she doesn't have any tissue on her, so she rolls up her sleeves and dries his tears. The brother whose life she intervened in is Tupac Shakur. And Pac's mother, a few days later, writes Maya and says, thank you because you saved his life on that day. And because Maya saves his life circa 1991, if you study Pac as an artist, as I do, you will find that between 1991 and 1996 was the most productive artistic period of Pac's career. He wrote so much during that time, that time that Maya bought him by coming down and intervening in his life. Because she does that, Pac writes so much during that time that they can't publish it all. So he's got album after album after album coming out after he's murdered in 96 in Vegas. One of those albums was released in 2003, an album called Resurrection. In 2009, my homie snaps this photo all the way across the world in Kathmandu. It is a picture of three brothers standing in front of one of the largest Buddhist shrines in the world. The oldest brother, turning to his right, is consoling the middle brother in the family whose hand is on his head because he is weeping. And the youngest brother on the left is watching, learning empathy. Now what you might not catch about the photo is the shirt that the oldest brother is wearing. It is the album shirt from Resurrection. The truth is that the problem in this country is that the narrative that is perpetuated in school is a narrative of rugged individualism. The individual rose that grows from the concrete. We need a declaration in this country to say that the point of education in this country is not to escape poverty. The point of education in this country is to end it. And when that is what we are teaching all of our children, okay, then we'll start out migrating our talent and the roses will come back as Pac did again and again and again to teach so many of the other young people that feel themselves down there trapped in the concrete. Okay. And when roses come back to the concrete, 
They create rose gardens. And the White House is not the only house that should have a rose garden in front. Thank you.